How do we interpret the world around us? Do we really trust what we see? In this series, experience visual and audio illusions, sensory puzzles, and brain tricks from the worlds of art, science, nature, and psychology, and learn why they baffle our senses. Let's explore how our mind works. How old are you? What can you remember from your childhood? Do you remember what you used to look like? What about your first best friend? Your favorite games? The first time you rode a bike? Thanks to our brain, we have access to things that we've experienced in the past. It's like having our own personal photo and video album, which we can view and replay whenever we want. How are these memories stored in our mind? Well, there are two ways. Short-term and long-term memory recollection. Short-term memories are processed in the front of the brain in a highly developed area called the prefrontal lobe. Short-term memories are then translated into long-term memories in a deep area in the brain called the hippocampus. This takes simultaneous memories from different sensory regions of the brain and connects them into a single episode of memory. For instance, you have a single memory of a birthday celebration instead of different memories of how it went, like how it looked, sounded, or smelled. When memories are played through the hippocampus, connections between neurons connected with a memory will become a fixed combination. For example, if you hear a music track, you will remember situations associated to where you heard that music. When scientists reviewed a brain scan, they saw different regions of the brain light up when someone thought of an episode of memory. This showed how memories represent an index of all these recorded thoughts and sensations. Our brain's hippocampus helps solidify the pattern of connections that form a memory. However, the memory itself depends on the solidity of the connections between individual brain cells. In experiments with animals, scientists have proven that removing or changing just a single chemical or molecule prevents the formation of memories. It can even destroy memories that already exist. Think about the things you did today, say what you had for breakfast. If you thought of a bowl of cereal or a plate full of bacon and eggs, that single memory was the result of a great and complex power. Every day, our brain processes information while all of the different systems work together to come up with a connected thought. Through memory, we are able to store, preserve, and reproduce information. Whether we remember something at a snap of a finger or a longer period of time, it takes a lot of factors in our brain to complete the process. Isn't it amazing how much information our brain can store? In fact, your memory can associate a scent with a certain event or occurrence. A smell can trigger the memory in your mind associated with it. Every single day, there are bits of information we need to keep in our head for just a few seconds. How much cash will you need to pay for a certain item? What's the phone number of that place you need to call? In these instances, you're using your short-term memory. Short-term memory comes in handy when accomplishing everyday tasks. This ability to temporarily hold a piece of information is something specific to humans. It causes certain regions in the brain to become very active, specifically in the prefrontal lobe. The prefrontal lobe at the very front of the brain is highly developed in human beings. It is why we have high and upright foreheads. So it is no surprise that the part of the brain that is most active during one of the most human activities is found in this highly developed prefrontal region. An experiment on fast forgetting was done in 1959. Participants were asked to memorize a three-letter sequence and then count backwards in sets of threes. Then, they were asked to remember the three-letter sequence after different lengths of time, counting backwards. The participants actually did surprisingly poorly on the test. 
only after six seconds of counting backwards in threes, on average, half of the original letters had been forgotten. By the time the participants were counting backwards for 12 seconds, less than 15% of what they originally remembered remained. After 18 seconds, it was completely forgotten. This experiment shows how fast information disappears of short-term memory. So if you ever experience talking to someone, getting cut, and then suddenly forgetting the last thing you talked about, that's how fast your short-term memory lets it go. Remember, short-term memory has a limited capacity. It can keep about seven items for no more than 20 or 30 seconds at a time. You can increase this capacity through using different strategies. For example, let's take this 10-digit number, 8005803392. This number can be too much to hold in your brain's short-term memory. But if we divide it into chunks like you would a telephone number, you will be able to keep it in your short-term memory long enough until you need to use it. Also, by repeating the number to yourself, you can keep resetting your short-term memory clock. Let's try it. Here's the number again. Did you get it right? With some repetition, we can store these bits of short-term memory information into our long-term memory. Fact we are more likely to remember the information that is provided if it is in a weird, difficult to read font. So now let's discuss long-term memory. As we learned earlier, important information is slowly transferred from our short-term memory into our long-term memory. The more times information is repeated or used, the more likely it will end up in our long-term memory or retained. So now you know why studying helps people do better on tests. Sometimes people easily store materials about subjects they already know something about. This is because the information has more meaning to them and it can be mentally connected to related information that is already stored in the long-term memory. People usually think of long-term memory when they think of the idea of memory itself. However, most experts believe that information should first pass through sensory and short-term memory before it can be stored as long-term memory in our brain. Here are some things you should consider when storing memory. Sleep is something we do every day. One of its roles, aside from allowing us to rest, is consolidating memory traces stored in our brain over the course of the day. In both animals and humans, an increase in the amount of rapid eye movement or REM sleep is observed during the night following a learning experience. So sleep deprivation can also affect our learning. Low frequency sleep, which happens at the start of the night, can also play a role in consolidating memories. Research shows that both major phases of sleep are involved and the alternation of low frequency sleep and REM sleep results in a beneficial effect on memory. Another thing to consider in memory, as with any other work, is organization. In organization, two main strategies can be done, repetition and elaboration. In repetition, you take a piece of information you are trying to memorize and repeat it over and over. You do this continuously to try to keep it in your short-term memory as long as possible. In elaboration, what you do is associate a new piece of information with other information you have already recorded in your long-term memory. So you incorporate this new fact into a bigger, coherent narrative that you are already familiar with. Over time, you will also learn your own set of strategies in memorizing things. You might have a technique you are comfortable with that works better for you than others. As long as we keep our minds working, it will keep getting sharper, even as we grow older. So don't ever stop using and exercising your brain. It's the only one you've got. So take care of it. Fact, caffeine doesn't maintain memory performances. It only increases alertness.
A lot of people like the number seven because they say it's a lucky number. Are you one of those people? While we can't really prove the luck it brings, we can learn another interesting thing about the number seven. One of the most recognized papers in psychology is entitled The Magical Number Seven Plus or Minus Two Some Limits on Our Capacity for Processing Information. Phew, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? This paper was published in 1956 by a cognitive psychologist named George A. Miller. He was from Princeton University's Department of Psychology. In this paper, it implies that the number of objects an average human can hold in their working memory is 7 plus or minus 2. This is also referred to as Miller's Law, based on the cognitive psychologist who discovered it. According to Miller, most adults can store between a range of 5 and 9 items in their short-term memory. Miller said there were only a certain number of slots that our short-term memory could store. But according to Miller, you can store more than one item in a chunk of memory. A chunk or an organized whole is considered one item in our primary memory. For instance, try memorizing this entire set of numbers all at once. 741492 When you interpret them as a set of 10 separate numbers, it will exceed the capacity of your working memory. This is because 10 chunks are too much to hold at a time. But if you chunk some of the numbers together, you will be able to remember it much easier. Try doing it now. 741-492-1945 This is similar to an experiment done in 1954 by a psychologist named Sidney Smith. He memorized sets of four binary digits, which were made up of only ones and zeros, like 0010, for example. Each set of four binary numbers was equivalent to one decimal digit. This meant that 16 binary numbers could be converted into four decimal numbers. So when Smith learned this conversion easily and automatically, his memory span for binary digits went from 10 to 40. Chunking shows us the importance of organization as a means of overcoming the limits of memory. Through organization, our memory is improved by grouping together little bits of data into larger wholes. This isn't limited to memorizing numbers. You can apply this to different types of information as well, like letters or words. Once you find a chunking technique you're comfortable with, your memory can greatly improve. Fact. Scientific research has shown that the human brain starts remembering things from the womb. Do you easily forget things? Are you good at remembering faces and names? Or do you usually run and hide when you see an old friend whose name you can't remember? Why do we forget information like this sometimes? According to a memory researcher named Elizabeth Loftus, there are four major reasons why people forget. Retrieval failure, interference, failure to store, and motivated forgetting. Let's discuss each one. Retrieval failure is also known as decay theory. According to this, a memory trace is created every time a new memory is formed. Sometimes you think you remember something, but you just can't seem to put your finger on it. This is an example of retrieval failure. One problem with this theory, though, is that according to research, memories that have not been rehearsed or remembered are quite stable in the long-term memory. Interesting. Another theory is the interference theory. This suggests that some memories compete and interfere with other memories. This can most likely happen with information that is very similar to other information that was previously stored in memory. The third theory is failure to store. This has less to do with forgetting and more to do with the fact that the memory never made it into the long-term memory in the first place. An example of this can be seen in an experiment by Nickerson and Adams. Researchers asked participants to identify the correct U.S. penny out of a group of incorrect pennies. If you do it yourself, try to draw a penny from your memory. And then, 
Compare your results to how an actual penny looks. Chances are, you were able to remember the shape and color of the penny. However, you probably forgot other minor details. The last theory is called motivated forgetting. This happens when we actively work to forget certain memories. We usually do this for traumatic or disturbing events or experiences. There are two basic forms of motivated forgetting, suppression and repression. Suppression is a conscious form of forgetting, while repression is an unconscious form of forgetting. The concept of repressed memories is not universally accepted by all psychologists. They say it is difficult, even impossible, to scientifically study if a memory has or has not been repressed. Mental activities like rehearsal and remembering are important ways of strengthening a memory, and usually painful or traumatic memories are less likely to be remembered, discussed, or rehearsed. Since that's the case, it's probably better not knowing. Fact, excessive stress has been shown to alter brain cells, brain structure, and brain function. Ouch! Did you know that we remember pain? Humans learn to repeat behavior that is beneficial to our survival. This was accidentally discovered during an experiment when an electrode implanted in a rat's brain slipped from its intended place and landed on the medial forebrain bundle. This is a group of nerve cells that leads from deep in the brain to the prefrontal cortex. After delivering a series of electric shocks to the electrode, the rat showed a keen interest in the area of the box where it received the first jolt. The researchers who did the experiment believed they found the region of the brain responsible for curiosity. But after further investigation, they realized they discovered the brain's reward center, a system of regions associated with delivering a sense of pleasure in return for certain behaviors like eating. This discovery showed that humans and animals are equipped to learn through motivation. Motivation can go both ways though. Animals can be motivated to not repeat a behavior, and this can be a result of pain. Based on early investigation into the nature of pain, nociceptors, which are specialized pain nerve receptors, sense damage or potential damage to tissue through stimuli like laceration, change in temperature, crushing, or other forms of injury. This sensation is translated into an electrical impulse, and then it travels to the brain where it is felt as pain. Through these memories, we know that we should not touch a stove or grasp a knife's blade, and to cover up when it's cold. However, pain isn't only physical. It can also be combined by physical or psychological pain. The cognitive mind is not alone in forming memories of pain, though. Research says that the nervous system can also form memories of pain, which can happen even after tissue removal. The phantom limb phenomenon shows that the mind retains its ability to experience pain even after nociceptors are no longer present. Other studies also found that the persistence of pain memory can lead to a restructuring of nervous system function. This can lead to chronic pain in a healthy person. Anesthesia can prevent the conscious mind from forming these pain memories during instances like surgery. However, the nervous system can still form its own pain memories. Medical professionals are discovering that analgesics, which are drugs that prevent pain in the nervous system, diminish the development of chronic pain later on. Fact, some people, about 12%, dream only in black and white, while others dream in color. Do you remember your last dreams? Dreams combine verbal, visual, and emotional stimuli into sometimes broken, nonsensical, and entertaining storylines. Experts disagree on the purpose of dreams. Let's first talk about the dream theory by Dr. Sigmund Freud. His theories are based on the ideas of repressed longing. 
Dreams allow the unconscious mind to act out unacceptable thoughts and desires. Carl Jung was a student of Dr. Freud, but he also had his own ideas that differed from his mentor. He did agree with the psychological origin of dreams, but said that dreams allowed us to reflect on our waking selves and solve our problems or think through issues. Researchers Alan Hobson and Robert McCarley did a research in 1973 that dismissed these old psychoanalytical ideas. They studied what went on in the brain during sleep and they came up with the idea that dreams were the result of random electrical brain impulses that pulled imagery from traces of experience stored in the memory. They said these images don't form the stories we remember as dreams. Instead, our waking mind tries to make sense of all this imagery and create stories without even realizing it. This is known as the activation synthesis hypothesis. It created a big rift in the dream research arena because of its leap from accepted theories in the past. Here's what happens in our brain when we dream. When we sleep, we go through five sleep stages. Initially, there is very light sleep, the type that's easy to wake up from. The next stage moves into a slightly deeper sleep. Then stages three and four are when our deepest sleep happens. After 90 minutes of sleep and after the fourth sleep stage, we go into REM sleep. While dreams usually take place during REM sleep, research shows that it can happen during the four stages outside REM or non-REM sleep. Most of these dreams don't have the intensity of REM dreams though. According to a dream researcher named L. Strumpel, we don't usually remember dreams because of several factors. He said many things are quickly forgotten when you first wake up, like physical sensations. He also said many dream images are not very intense, so they are easily forgotten. Another reason which is possibly the strongest of his theories is that we usually learn and remember by both association and repetition. Since dreams are very unique and we can't go back to experience them, remembering them can be quite difficult. From the time we were born, we have been collecting memories and learning various skills. Over time, all these new things we've absorbed make up who we are, even the dreams we experience when we sleep. The combination of all of these things creates our unique personality, which, even if similar to others, can never be duplicated. The more we remember, the more we can learn. Keep in mind though, it's nearly impossible to remember everything. So live life and keep making the memories you want to keep remembering, even if there's a chance you'll forget them later on.